Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and I'm here today with Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee. Hi, Don. Great to be here. Tom Jones and I had a terrific time interviewing Mike Griffin. Yeah, I sat this one out given that both you and Tom have had extensive experience working with Dr. Griffin at NASA and on the NASA Advisory Council. I have to say it was fun to eavesdrop on you three talking about NASA, space flight, and much else. Ken, I can't help but notice that the esteemed and honorable Double Secret Selection Committee seems to largely select STEM Talk guests from among your friends. You have a problem with that? No. (laughs) <laughs> perhaps I have interesting friends, or perhaps you are mistaken regarding the selection policies of the committee, which are, by the way, highly confidential and special access only. As will be made clear during this episode, Mike Griffin is a remarkable fellow. In addition to serving as the NASA administrator, he has worked in numerous leadership positions in academia, government, and industry. Always a person to be well prepared, Mike has something like six graduate degrees and was, I think, working on his seventh when the president selected him to serve as NASA administrator. That's amazing. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the blushingly wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continuously, and carefully, mind you, reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname Meatballs Mom. Great nickname, that one. Here is presumably her five-star review, which is titled Thumbs Up. I downloaded this in order to feel intellectually superior to my peers. It's totally working. I'm glad to hear that. (laughs) And thank you, Meatballs Mom and all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, now on to today's interview with Mike Griffin. Fasten your seatbelts and prepare for launch. Nominated by President George W. Bush and confirmed by the United States Senate, Michael Griffin began his duties as the 11th Administrator of NASA on April 14, 2005. Prior to being nominated as NASA Administrator, Griffin was serving as Space Department Head at Johns Hopkins University's Applied Physics Laboratory. He was previously President and Chief Operating Officer of NQTEL Incorporated and also served in several key positions within Orbital Sciences Corporation. Earlier in his career at NASA, Griffin served as Associate Administrator for Exploration in the early 1990s and then becoming Chief Engineer in March 1993. He also served as Deputy for Technology at the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization in the Pentagon. After his time as NASA Administrator, Griffin accepted a position as eminent scholar and a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. In 2012, the Schaefer Corporation announced that Griffin would assume the role of chairman and chief executive officer at the company, a position in which he continues to serve. Mike Griffin received a bachelor's degree in physics from Johns Hopkins University, a master's degree in aerospace science from Catholic University of America, a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Maryland, a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Southern California, a master's degree in applied physics from Johns Hopkins University, a master's degree in business administration from Loyola College, and a master's degree in civil engineering from George Washington University. In addition, he is a certified flight instructor with instrument and multi-engine ratings. Over his career, Mike Griffin has received a litany of awards and recognitions, including being named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in 2008. Frankly, 
If I attempted to enumerate all his honors right now, we would not have any time remaining for the interview. STEM talk. 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 Hi, welcome to STEM Talk. This is your host, Don Carnegie, and joining us for STEM Talk today is Dr. Michael Griffin. Michael, welcome to STEM Talk. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. We also have IHMC's director and CEO, Dr. Ken Ford, with us. Hi, Michael. Good morning, Ken. And we have NASA astronaut and IHMC senior research scientist, Tom Jones, who's also joining us today. Mike, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you again. Welcome. Well, Tom, it's always good to, to uh, talk to you. So given the extensive professional history of both Ken and Tom with Dr. Griffin, they are going to lead today's discussion, and I'm going to temporarily switch from host to moderator, just in case anyone has to keep these guys in line. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, Mike, let's get started with uh, asking you about what sparked your early interest in science as a career. Well, to be honest, I'm not sure that I could have ever done anything else, Tom. I, I think the proximate cause um, was that my the first book I can remember my mother giving me, and she may have given me C-Spot Run or something like that that I didn't notice, but she gave me an astronomy book uh, in 1954 for Christmas, um, the year that I was five years old and, and learning to read. And I was just captivated by this astronomy book. It was called A Child's Book of Stars. And I, I read it until it was falling apart. And then when I got older and could you know, go to school libraries and the, the small town library where we lived, I started picking out other books on, on science and space and things like that. And I, I guess that really started it all. Fantastic. And I, I had the same experience. In fact, on my shelf here, I have a, a science book that my grandmother gave me. So we had the same kind of spark that, uh, that uh, got us interested in space, I think. It's amazing the influence that uh, an old that an adult can have on a kid by putting the right book in front of them. In a, in a in a nice vignette to that story, the uh, uh, our our friend Marsha Ivans, the uh, astronaut, mm -hmm. my crewmate, your your former crewmate on I guess it was STS uh, one hundred two ninety eight ninety eight. Sorry, um, uh, Marsha. Uh, got the book unbeknownst to me from my wife and had the STS-114 return to flight crew under Eileen Collins uh, fly it in space for me and, and returned it. It's quite a, it's, it's a nice memento. So who were your mentors along the way as you grew up and headed towards college that uh, continued your interest in science? Honestly, I was more self-motivated, Tom. I, I did have one really great physics teacher as a senior in high school. Uh, Ray Trimmer was his name. Uh, but he was uh, more in the matter of urging us on. Uh, I was already fully committed to um, a career in, in math and science and space uh, long before I ever got to high school. So, Mike, that brings us to your long and storied career in space exploration. Tell us about some of the highlights that you regard as the high points of your career. Well, my career has gone uh, back and forth between and among um, DOD space, uh, civil space, um, robotic scientific spacecraft and missions, and human spaceflight. And honestly, I've enjoyed them all. Uh, I guess if I had to do, you know, the instant response thing, um, uh, possibly the, the single mission of an, an experience of which I'm maybe most proud and look back on is, is being the chief engineer for the first uh, space intercept mission uh, ever done against a booster in powered flight as part of the early missile defense program under under President Reagan. Uh, that was a, an extraordinarily lucky, being able to be in, in charge of that uh, was an extraordinarily lucky break and uh, one that really uh, enormously boosted my career and, and, and I really felt used uh, whatever talent I had and used it to the maximum. Uh, so that stands out. Were you with the BDO organization at that time, Ballistic Missile Defense? It was called uh, Strategic Defense Initiative Office mm. in those days. It was the predecessor to the then BMDO, Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, and which was the later renamed the Missile Defense Agency under uh, the second President Bush. But yes, I, I was part of that organization. Uh, that was just enormously rewarding. Um, 
then uh, working on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you know, I was part of the team looking at overall systems. Uh, I was working at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in those days, and NASA headquarters had asked us to take a look at the system engineering aspects of, of Hubble, and uh, also worked on the fine guidance system and the moving target tracking algorithms and things of that nature. Real geek stuff that I, <laughs> you know, led a team, really loved it. Um, I was always very proud of having participated in, in the Hubble project. And 26 years after launch, it's still going strong. That must be very satisfying. Well, I think to all of us that love science and space, the Hubble's an icon and, and should be. And then uh, other neat experiences. I, I probably will never forget the STS-121 launch, which as you, Tom, I know you recall, was the second shuttle return to flight mission after Columbia. And on, I think you'll also recall that on 114, Eileen Collins' flight, the mm -hmm. first return to flight mission, we lost another huge chunk of foam. Uh, and, and it became very clear that we really, at NASA, really at that time, did not understand the, the foam loss mechanisms. And so, uh, I, again, I know you remember, I, I grounded the fleet to, to some amount of public controversy. And then it was a year before we tried again. Mm -hmm. And by the time we tried again, there was so much controversy over it all as a decision to launch or not to launch that I actually wound up with an IG investigation against me um, <laughs> for authorizing the launch when some some did not agree. Um, it, it all worked out extremely well um, from a technical point of view, but the uh, environmental circumstances surrounding STS-121 are something I, I won't forget soon. For a period of time, you served as uh, president and chief operating officer of InQtel. That must have been a quite interesting undertaking. Can you tell us a little about the goals and methods of this innovative organization? Yeah, Ken, I would have to say that, that uh, actually possibly the very coolest job I've ever had was being president of InQtel. And, and for our listeners who don't know what that is, uh, it's, it's I-N hyphen capital Q hyphen T-E-L, and uh, it's loosely characterized as the CIA's venture capital company. Uh, I, it's an idea that I wish, frankly, that I had thought up, but actually uh, former Defense Secretary Bill Perry and uh, Norm Augustine and Paul Kaminsky and folks like that got together. Uh, Ruth David decided that um, the CIA did not have uh, the kind of access that they needed to the high-tech uh, developments taking place in Silicon Valley and in other areas of, of the private sector. And so a 501c3, a, a nonprofit organization, was chartered by Congress to um, allow that sort of access and provided with some seed funding to... Uh, help spur developments in the private sector for companies that were thought, whose products were thought to have a useful intelligence community application. Now that application might take the form of a, of, a, of a feature embedded in software that not everyone knew about, or it might just have been a, a straight up application of a, a particular technology like a new battery, or, or, or it could be anything. But if it could be useful to the intelligence community, we would back it. Um, it was an, an extraordinarily eye-opening and exciting venture. Uh, one of the things I enjoy telling people about is that uh, I was part of the deal where we we did Google Earth, uh, which was known as Keyhole in the early days as a company, and uh, then Google bought them. And, and so when you open up Google Earth today, in part, you can thank InQtel uh, for having uh, recognized and, and helped to augment that development it's in its earliest days. Wow, that's interesting. Now, when, when did you realize that you wanted to work at NASA? Well, I would have, I guess I wasn't even yet a teenager. Um, I was, uh, NASA was formed in 1958. I was nine years old. Uh, I immediately, rec I, I was already interested in space for several years previously, and, and I believe from that time forward that eventually I would work with NASA and uh, counting a stint as a, uh, a contractor on a 
console in mission operations at, at Goddard Space Flight Center, one of, one of the on-site contractor staff, and another uh, period of time working at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and then two assignments at NASA headquarters in, at different periods. I, I was with the agency four different times. At that early age, did you have any ideas about what job at NASA you might most enjoy? Well, when I was very young, um, I thought that, you know, being an engineer or a scientist, and I, at that age, I really didn't distinguish between the two, uh, was the highest uh, goal anyone could aspire to. And, and I had not much interest in management or, uh, or in managing the bureaucracy. Um, at a substantially later age, probably in my earlier 20s, um, it became clear to me that I was constantly being asked by my own superiors to manage the efforts of others on, on, in project or in institutional roles. Uh, I, I was at one point the youngest group supervisor, I was told, that, that they had ever had at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, so at least some people thought I had a talent for management. I'm not sure I ever really agreed with it, but uh, I kept accepting the jobs. Uh, and so at some point, probably in my early to mid-20s, I, I began to realize that um, I might reasonably aspire to higher-level management. Okay, Mike, you first took a role in NASA as the chief of exploration in the early 1990s. And then you came back a few years later as the NASA administrator. Now the NASA budget annually is pushing to $20 billion a year. What's the biggest challenge in running an enterprise that's that expensive, that far flung? How did you handle that kind of a, a mammoth institution? Well, Tom, uh, you mentioned two of my uh, stints in, in NASA in Washington. And of course, I had previously also been in the Pentagon as the Deputy Director for Technology at, at, a, at SDIO, as I'd mentioned earlier. So I'd had considerable time in Washington between and among those various jobs, all for multi-billion dollar organizations. Um, and so one of the things that I had figured out quite some time previously was that any management job, you really, you really need to think of it that you're managing maybe 15 people at the most. I, I don't have the bandwidth to be able to manage more people than that. And so what you're doing is trying very carefully to select, you know, a great team of people who can complement your own skills, but who are not the same as you. And you work with that team of 15 people, say. Well, they work with a team of 10 or 15 people and so on down the line. And, and if, you, if you think about it that way, managing a large organization is not substantively different than managing a small organization. It, it only affects how many layers down you go before you've got everybody included. Um, because you, you just can't, as the administrator of NASA, worry about some you know, very small effort of a few million dollars being conducted at a at a, an individual NASA center unless and until, you know, that, that issue either does something great or becomes a problem and then you have to devote some attention to it. So, so that was the way that I managed a, a very large, far-flung uh, business, if you, if you will, and, and I hope that makes sense. It does, and you mentioned the challenge of recovering from the Columbia accident and getting the shuttle back up on its feet. Any other challenges in your tenure as NASA administrator that come to mind that are um, the, the most challenging to you? Well, their challenges are a number of different kinds. Of course, we had the challenge of trying to figure out how we were going to do uh, another Hubble repair mission, which we ultimately did do. We had the challenge of designing a new system architecture because at the time I walked into the job, it had already been determined that the shuttle would be retired and replaced with another system and that we would be returning to the moon. And so, you know, putting all of that in place was certainly interesting, but it was a challenge. 
Uh, and then there are other kinds of challenges, dealing with uh, what I sometimes call official Washington, meaning the other organizations that have a stake in what NASA does or claim to have a stake in what NASA does. Uh, and, and then, of course, dealing with, with Congress. So e each of those is a challenge of a different nature, um, all of them memorable. I am sure. Micah, what do you see as the most important benefit arising from the nation's civil space program? Well, to me, the most important benefit of space exploration uh, actually comes from a look back at history. Uh, I, I contend, and I've not been able to identify a counterexample, I contend that uh, a nation which does not explore the, the frontiers of its time, does not push the frontiers of its time, is consigning itself to, to the backwater of history. That, that history is written by, the history we study is written by those nations which have pioneered the frontiers of their times. Um, I believe very strongly in the values uh, and, and mores uh, and, and cultural imperatives of Western civilization as we have come to understand it from, you know, Greek times. Uh, we're certainly not perfect, but I, I believe that the values espoused by Westerners are superior to those which have evolved previously or in other places. Uh, space is a human frontier, and some humans somewhere at some time will open it up and will settle it, and we will use the resources of the solar system for our benefit. Um, the decisions made in the future about how we will use space and, and its resources for mankind, those decisions will be made by the nations and the societies that show up. They won't be made by the, the nations and societies that are sitting home and watching others develop it on TV. Uh, I, want, I want my nation, I want my society, I want my civilization uh, to be in the vanguard of those efforts. So that is what I believe to be most important. So, Mike, you've mentioned the recovery of the shuttle fleet after the Columbia disaster. What were the engineering details and challenges that you had to deal with to make the shuttle fleet safe enough to fly again and risk astronauts' lives on? Well, when you talk about recovering from the Columbia accident, of course, everyone knows that that accident was brought about by the unintended release of a fairly large piece of foam at, uh, which impacted a wing at high speed. Uh, broke a hole in the uh, in the thermal insulation tiles that protect the shuttle on entry, and and the, because of that, the vehicle and the crew were lost. Um, what people don't realize, I think, in in many cases, is there was never supposed to be any foam release from the external tank and its surroundings onto the orbiter, and yet we were experiencing you know, continued events of foam release, which showed that we really didn't understand um, how the foam was being bonded, why it was not being bonded as strongly as it should have been. We didn't understand what was causing it to come off. And so when I, when I took over, uh, to be very direct about it, I, I chartered a new group of people um, to study that issue and come up with answers because I, I didn't feel that just continuing down the path we were going was was going to get us where we wanted to be. We weren't we're not seeking we were not seeking to understand why it was really happening from a fundamental physics point and engineering point of view. So that changed. Um, we stopped going from you know we're always three months from flight. And, and, and took a new path, which is we'll fly when we understand why this is happening and, and can fix it. So that was one thing. Um, of course, the other challenge was we didn't really understand the damage mechanisms of the foam, pieces of foam on the orbiter when they did come off. I mean, you were, we realized ultimately that we were never going to get foam released down to, to nothing. Some amount was always going to come off. But having some control over the size of the pieces and when they came off and understanding the statistics of damage to the orbiter uh, was, was a major effort. Uh, Jim Peters of NASA Johnson Space Center uh, was uh, particularly influential in, in leading 
an understanding of, of what the statistical properties were of foam release and, and damage. Um, and once we understood that, we, had a, uh, we, we just had a far better handle on what risks we were taking. Now, there were other perspectives that I, as, as administrator, I wanted to keep on the table. Um, it is so easy when you have one problem to focus all your efforts on that one problem, and then you risk getting caught by another threat that, that you knew about but had ignored. So, for example, during the period of time in the early 90s when I was NASA chief engineer, um, every flight readiness review that I would go to, and Tom, you may recall some of these yourself, um, people were worried about you know, losing a turbine blade from a shuttle main engine and having it go out the side of an engine and destroying an orbiter in, in that fashion. Uh, we never had that experience. That never occurred, but it was always a threat. And so, just as one example, I tried, as administrator, I tried to make sure that we were not losing sight of some of our known historical risks while everyone was focused on uh, foam damage. Um, so let me stop there. Do those answers uh, make sense? Oh, I think they were very uh, good examples of how you had to juggle all of these factors to get the shuttle fleet flying again. And while the, the shuttle fleet was grounded, that put a halt to the resupply and the construction of the International Space Station in parallel. And you couldn't restore that supply route and the uh, crew transfers until the orbiter fleet got back to uh, space again. So how did you manage the international aspects of this, where you have a consortium of partners building the space station? The U.S. now can no longer launch to the station. How did you get the international cooperation and commitment that you needed to keep the space station on a good footing until shuttle flights could resume? That's an excellent question, Tom. Uh, I mean, first of all, the environment when I took over um, uh, was very divided concerning whether we would even finish the space station. President Bush had said in a, in a national speech that we would finish the station, and the Congress had supported that. But within, I'll just say, the Washington bureaucracy, there were deep divisions of opinion on whether we were actually going to do that. And there were, was quite a large number of people who felt we should just stop where we were. Um, I therefore took it as, as probably my most important mission to get on the ground a plan by which we would finish the station. So one of the things I, I did was to go to our European and uh, Russian partners. Russia had been added as a space station partner by the Clinton administration in the mid-90s time frame. And, of course, you'll recall that we still had Soyuz and Progress flights for crew and cargo to the station, so we could keep it uh, manned at a, a reduced uh, crew level uh, while we were returning the orbiter to flight. So I went to our partners and outlined a plan by which we would finish the station uh, through the compromise of minimizing the number of utilization flights uh, that we would conduct, utilization flights being those flights devoted to the con conduct of, of scientific experiments, and we would maximize the number of assembly flights we could do. So the goal was to get the project finished, and then we would utilize it later. Uh, and, of course, I kept them up to date on our progress in, in actually technically returning the shuttle to flight. There wasn't, I, I wasn't holding any cards to my vest. And so I asked each of our partners to accept delays in when their hardware would arrive on orbit. But I promised them that while I was administrator, as, as long as I was sitting in the chair, that their hardware would make it to orbit. And when I took over, there was considerable doubt about that. There was a lot of discussion about just not flying the Japanese or European laboratories, for example. And I, I found that to be unacceptable. And so I, I made them a personal promise that, that we would do that or, or uh, I, would, I would throw my badge down. Um, we were gonna keep our commitments to our partners. And they accepted my promises. And, and we did do all that, as you recall. So, so the main difficulties involved in, in getting everything back on track was just getting everybody on the same page, making sure that everybody knew what the plan was, that the plan made as much sense as it could make given the constraints that we had, and, and asking for their, their trust and commitment and then following through on our end. Mm -hmm. 
STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Mike, in uh, May 2009, astronauts on Space Shuttle Atlantis repaired and upgraded the Hubble Space Telescope for the fifth time, leaving it better than ever. Can you talk a little bit about the process leading to the decision to authorize this final repair mission after it had been canceled by your predecessor as too risky in the aftermath of the Columbia accident? Yeah, there's a lot of history there, Ken. Um, So, of course, I think everyone knows what you just mentioned, that uh, in the immediate aftermath of Columbia, it was determined that the only shuttle flights that would be conducted would be those that would go to the space station, because if there was another Columbia-like incident, you could park the crew on the station until a rescue shuttle or a series of rescue Soyuz vehicles could be used to to get them off the station. They wouldn't have to undergo a hazardous reentry. Uh, and, and, but only, only a mission to the station offered that possibility. And so other, other missions were deemed too risky, quote unquote. Um, that was from my point of view, an an unfortunate pronouncement for the agency to make, because really, if you look at the statistics of it, there are, there's a, a fairly small percentage of things that can go wrong with an orbiter on ascent for which the space station is the answer to the problem. Uh, And so it was not statistically a a significantly different issue. Uh, And of course, the other thing was that there were ways around uh, having a rescue mission while not having the space station available that that one could conceive of doing. Uh, What we ended up doing, of course, was to, to prepare a second shuttle with a space station payload and to have it on the pad ready to go in case we needed it. Now, we, we didn't need it, but it was ready to go. Other possibilities existed. For example, we could have asked our Russian partners for uh, to prepare a series of, of Soyuz vehicles ahead of time and have them ready to go should, should there have been a necessity. That was at least a theoretical possibility. We didn't go down that path, but there was more than one way to, to skin that cat, and I, I was convinced we, we could do it. Um, so... Uh, after joining NASA, I uh, got some of the really smart folks at the Johnson Space Center, uh, together with others from other, other centers, looking at how we could arrange a Hubble repair mission such that it would be as safe for the crew as if they were flying to station. And, and so we were able to do that. They came back to me with a, a set of good results. And as you'll recall, I announced that we would, we would do it. Now, there was a negative impact on, on that came out of that. Nothing is for free. Um, when, when you prepare a shuttle orbiter for a particular mission, it, it takes that orbiter out of the flow for 18 months, maybe more, uh, for, for whatever payload it's carrying. So when we put the Hubble repair mission back into the queue, uh, that meant that the space station assembly uh, was automatically going to be delayed by at least another year. A- and it was. Ultimately, we did not retire the shuttle fleet until 2011 instead of the originally planned 2010. Um, I thought that was a trade worth making. Uh, one of the things people usually are not aware of is that because it was the Columbia orbiter that was lost, um, the, 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 prior to the loss of Columbia, Columbia was available for non-space station missions because the orbiter was too, that orbiter was too heavy to fly to the station and carry any useful payload. So Columbia was available for space life sciences missions, for Hubble repair missions, for things like that, because it had no station utility. So when Columbia was lost, any, any use of another orbiter for, for example, a Hubble-type mission automatically put a delay in the space station completion schedule. And, and as much as anything else, that was really responsible for the desire not to do the Hubble mission the first time around. 
Hmm. So we just fixed all that. That's very interesting. Yeah, I always regarded STS-125 as perhaps the highlight of the shuttle program, at least from my perspective. The uh, afternoon of the launch, looking at two shuttles gleaming in the sun, sitting at the ready on their pads, that was an awesome sight. That was pretty cool. I wish I had still been able to be there to see it, uh, but it, it was it was pretty neat. It was incredible, Mike. You would have been proud of it. Mike, uh, as everyone's aware, since 2011 when the shuttles retired, we have not had the ability to launch U.S. astronauts from Florida to the space station, giving access to space for our astronaut corps. Can you talk a little bit about the why about the why of the U.S. today being unable to effectively plan and deploy a transportation system suitable to support the space station, even though the shuttle's retirement was necessary and was obviously looming on the horizon? Boy, you have really baited the hook with that one, Tom. <laughs> I, know, <laughs> I know that you know this is an area where I have very strong feelings that, that I've expressed many, many, many times in public uh, to include multiple uh, uh, testimony, testimonies before Congress. Uh, so, so briefly, we are in the situation you describe because of, of uh, just frankly, poor, very poor planning and, in my opinion, a lack of the strategic importance to the United States of maintaining uh, a lead and, and, in fact, maintaining an obvious lead in, in uh, our ability to put people, our people, in space. Uh, I think that that has a tremendous strategic, national, geopolitical importance, and we've ignored it. Now, how did we get there? Well, r originally, the after, uh, originally meaning after the Columbia accident, the plan, as you'll recall, uh, as announced by the president and ratified by the Congress in two successive uh, NASA authorization acts, the plan was to return the shuttle to flight, fi fix what was wrong, return the shuttle to flight, finish the space station, and then construct a new system which would be capable of both servicing the space station and returning to the moon. And we were going to establish a permanent U.S. lunar base. Uh, and I say a U.S. lunar base, that would be actually a misnomer, uh, a, a U.S.-led international effort to develop an international lunar base in much the same manner as we had developed the International Space Station. So that was the plan on the table. Um, we also intended and did uh, put a substantial amount of, sum, of money, uh, a sum of uh, well over half a billion dollars out there to stimulate the development of commercial uh, cargo initially and later crew carrying capability if any of the so-called commercial space enterprises were, were able to step up to the challenge. Uh, but we were not intending to put them in, in a series, if you'll pardon an engineering expression. We didn't want to be solely dependent upon that path. We wanted there to be a, a, a U.S. government developed system as well because uh, it's, it's my belief at least that spaceflight is, is actually still pretty hard. So that was our plan. Um, the, even during the Bush administration, uh, and, and quite regrettably, the Office of Management and Budget was able to uh, slow down the development of a system to replace the shuttle fleet uh, while maintaining the shuttle retirement date. So, so even during the Bush administration, uh, we opened up a gap between when the last shuttle flight would be and when the first flight of a new system could be. It was uh, supposed to be about two years, as I recall. Originally, start. it was supposed to be two years. The OMB stretched it to four, and, and I found that very frustrating, and I, I, in fact, so testified every time I had the chance. Uh, but it was at least a gap and not a cliff. Um, I was concerned about that in... in as I've mentioned, for, for reasons of geopolitics, but I was also concerned about it for very practical reasons, such as sh space station logistics. Um, having gone to the trouble to build a, a space station whose value I, I had estimated at around $75 billion of, of cost in the, in the station, uh, 
I at least thought we should be doing everything in our power to make sure that it was sustained uh, appropriately and, and used appropriately. And to do that, you needed, uh, a, you know, at least a couple times a year, you needed to be able to visit the station. Uh, this was not like the period between, say, Apollo and shuttle, where if we went a few years before flying people in space with a new system, that was okay because there was nothing dependent upon it. This was a situation where we had a $75 billion asset depending upon our ability to sustain it. So in my mind, it was like, you know, planting a research station at the South Pole and then uh, telling the people who were camped there that if we were able to get an icebreaker through, we'd, we'd supply them. But if not, well, good luck to you. <laughs> I'm being a bit cavalier, but you get my point. Um, so the new administration came along in 2009, and then at the in early 2010, I think much to everyone's surprise, uh, they canceled the uh, U.S. government developed system to uh, replace the shuttle for low Earth orbit transportation. Uh, over the course of the next year or so, uh, a large number of of substantially political arguments were had and, and the, uh, uh, the heavy lifter for uh, returning to the moon was retained in the program, although plans actually to return to the moon were, were scuttled. Uh, but most crucially, any near-term U.S. government development of a capability of putting our own astronauts in orbit uh, was sidelined. Instead, it was stated that we would rely on the increasingly capable commercial space companies uh, to, to lift that, that burden. Uh, from my perspective, that was misguided uh, because before I want to rely on a commercial space company to take people to orbit, I would at least like them to carry the laundry that the astronauts will wear when they get there. In other words, I, I want to see some substantive demonstrations uh, of capability before trusting them to, to lift crew. And of course, there was no, at that time the decision was made, there was no such capability nor any that looked even close. Um, and the second thing is, I, I don't want my country to be hostage to uh, offerings by commercial developers who have a, a, a monopoly position. It might be, it, it is true, that government is not a very efficient tool for the development of uh, things like you know rockets and airplanes and space vehicles, but um, it's uh, probably a more efficient tool than being held hostage to a monopoly. And, and so I didn't, I didn't favor a situation like that. And then thirdly, when one scratched the surface, the, the commercial space companies that were being uh, asked to develop these new techniques and capabilities uh, were not actually commercial in the sense of operating on their own money, developing a product, and then selling it back to the taxpayer. They were really being taxpayer funded. They were just different companies than had been used in the past. Uh, there, there was really nothing commercial about it. And, and so that concatenation of circumstances and arrangements bothered me greatly, and I've, I've said so on quite a number of occasions. So now we're in the middle of 2016, and uh, the, the companies which are supposedly developing these capabilities uh, on government funding, I might add, are now uh, saying that 2018 is about the earliest date that we could expect to see uh, a successful crew deployment from U.S. shores. And um, you and I are both old men now, Tom, and we've seen a lot of launch delays in our time. And um, I think if we're saying 2018, then uh, I suspect it could be yet a while longer. So that's a very long-winded answer to your question. It's a very complex story, and it's a set of behaviors on the part of U.S. policymakers uh, with which I am appalled. During the early days of your time as NASA Administrator, there was considerable consternation in elements of the space science community regarding the advent of the Constellation program that we just discussed and also plans to return to the moon. The critics cast the argument in terms of science versus exploration and further asserted that human exploration without science was mere tourism. Do you distinguish 
science from exploration, and if so, in what way? Well, that was indeed a big battle, uh, and, and it was somewhat unfairly uh, assigned. The causes were somewhat unfairly assigned to the exploration program. Uh, they were actually more uh, associated with getting the station finished, and, and I can talk about that if you want. But your question directly was, do I distinguish between exploration and science? And um, to a certain extent, yes, I do. Uh, they are, I, I would hasten to say, I don't see them as opposed. Uh, they're not antithetical to one another. Um, many of our great voyages of exploration and discovery in human history also yielded amazing scientific results, even if they were not initially intended to do so. Um, and, and so I, I, I just don't accept that they're in opposition to one another. Um, but nonetheless, the careful planning of scientific experiments and their conduct and the obtaining and analysis of results from those experiments is quite substantially different from exploration as we usually consider it. And so I consider them to be different but closely allied enterprises. Um, let me stop there. Great, great. Uh, what do you see as the role of science in human exploration, in human spaceflight? Well, human beings are the best tools we have yet seen for determining what the scientific questions ought to be. Uh, by going new places and seeing new things and experiencing new things, uh, human beings frame the questions which more careful scientific missions or expeditions can answer later. Um, Trying to do the science before the preliminary exploration is conducted uh, seems to be, to me, to be in many ways self-defeating. Um, so, so I believe that exploration enables good science. Conversely, um, I think science is critical to the conduct of good exploration. Uh, there is a lot about uh, venturing into space with humans that we do not yet understand. Uh, human spaceflight is replete with opportunities for life science to advance itself. Um, human spaceflight is replete with opportunities for uh, scientists to have their experiments conducted in better ways with a more personal touch that can ever be done uh, by remote control. And, and so I would say the two enterprises are synergistic and advance one another. I agree. Um, in, in during these early days of your time as administrator, you engaged uh, these folks, the critics, in a dialogue during which many topics emerged, including the fundamental nature of NASA's relationship with the external science community. This discussion also involved a disagreement regarding the structure and the appropriate role of the NASA Advisory Council. Could you explain the nature of this disagreement? Yes, that was an interesting time. I, I appreciate your reminding me of it. When I took over NASA, uh, the NASA Advisory Council uh, seemed to have, seemed to me to have a largely formulaic role. And in fact, we had actors and actresses and media personalities and such on the NASA Advisory Council that uh, seemed to me to, to have uh, no, real, no really useful function. Um, and at the same time, as the so-called NASA Advisory Council, which should have been rendering advice to the administrator and to the administrator's uh, key teammates, uh, we had at the same time a host of individual advisory committees on specialty topics. You know, we had a, a, an, an asteroids advisory group and a lunar, lunar exploration advisory group and a Mars exploration advisory group and, and on and on and on uh, through heliophysics and life sciences and, and everything you can think of. Each of these advisory groups uh, reported out separately to the, the person or organization who had chartered them 
but there was no coherence between and among them. And in fact, in many ways, they were competitors because as I'm sure you'll realize, it's, it's no great trick for the head of, say, the heliophysics advisory group to recommend that a new heliophysics experiment be done and that the next planned planetary lander on Mars could afford to wait a while. And I'm making this up as I go along, but I'm sure you'll appreciate that, that dynamic between independent and uncoordinated advisory groups. Um, that kind of dynamic is, is not useful to the planning and the running of what it is that the agency will do. So I set about, I, I wanted the input from those advisory groups. Don't, I, I would not, I would not want to have anyone think otherwise. I wanted their input, but I wanted their input to be organized, c- correlated, coalesced by a, a an organizational construct which would uh, bring the different and competing advice together and make them consistent with priorities for funding and direction that were conveyed to us by Congress. Because in the end, every single dollar that NASA spends is appropriated by Congress and prioritized by Congress. If the president doesn't sign the the legislation, well, then, then we're into a different kind of a discussion about vetoes and overriding vetoes. But in the end, um, what, is, what, is appropri- what is directed and appropriated by Congress is what agencies do. And so scientific advice to the contrary was not very useful to me. So I organized a NASA advisory council under first uh, the leadership of of Dr. Harrison Schmidt, the former U.S. senator, geologist, former Apollo 17 astronaut, and then Ken later yourself when when Jack retired uh, from that position. I organized a construct in which all of the advisory committees would report up through principals on the NASA Advisory Council who were selected for their expertise in different specialties. Uh, That brought a considerable amount of order to the discussion and and allowed the Advisory Council to come forward with actionable uh, requests of the NASA career staff um, and and allowed us to shape our budget in, in more ordered and more intelligent ways so that we could make, I thought, uh, better use of, of the science money we were being given by the Congress. Now, again, that's a very lengthy answer to your question. Uh, it was a very complex process. I'm sure you'll appreciate that not all scientists in the scientific community um, welcomed my efforts because uh, if you tell an, an esteemed scientist who, with a long career history, uh, that his advice Uh, which he used to be able to give freely to anyone who would listen to it, uh, now had to be brought forward through the actions of a a larger committee chaired by someone other than himself, that that scientist would now not be very happy. Uh, Their happiness was regrettably not my first concern. (laughs) NASA's uh, unmanned uh, robotics programs are doing some really amazing things these days and, uh, and for some time in the past. Can robotic mission elements, uh, in your view, enhance human exploration of the moon and Mars? If we have our wits about us, we will be using uh, robots to augment human exploration and humans to augment robotic exploration in every reasonable way that we can do so. Agreed. Uh, The artificial juxtaposition of human exploration and robotic science is unhelpful on so many levels. And he seems driven largely by budget concerns and other sorts of uh, issues. It seems to me to be driven by budget concerns. It it, it does, because uh, it is true that human exploration is a more costly venture than most, not all, but most robotic science missions. And if you are a scientific principal investigator whose, whose career and stature depends upon executing successful robotic science missions, it's quite logical that you're not going to want that money to go to some other enterprise. Uh, And and I understand the logic of of that position, even if the logic is rather self-interested, but I don't don't believe that such logic should be used to determine national policy. 
Okay, let's keep talking about uh, Mars exploration, Mike. After several failed attempts to jumpstart a return to deep space, how can NASA garner the long-term support and commitment needed to achieve its stated goal of sending humans to Mars? Well, Tom, as, as you know from our long association, no one wants people uh, on Mars more than I do. I would argue that the best path for that goes through the moon and that, oh, by the way, the moon is going to be pretty interesting in itself, but uh, I, I'm certainly fascinated by, by Mars. Um, your question is intriguing because carried in its words is the implication that um, the population of the United States isn't in favor of such things and needs to be persuaded. Whereas in fact, um, and, and I believe you know this, I'm, I'm kind of just pulling your chain. Um, in, in fact, every time we do any kind of a poll, I'll loosely say a Gallup poll, although not, not all of them are done by Gallup, but every time we do any kind of a public opinion poll, we find that something like 70% of the American population supports or strongly supports NASA and its goals, um, which they loosely understand to be, you know, the development of, of human spaceflight and, and great science missions. So when I look at that statistic, I don't look at that as what do we do to get that last 30%. What I look at it as find me a politician who wouldn't like to get elected with a 70% margin. You know, find me a commercial product that wouldn't like to have a 70% market share. From my perspective, uh, NASA and, and space exploration have a 70% brand approval. And trying to get better than that might be kind of fruitless. What is missing, in, in my opinion, is the translation of that general public approval of what we do in, in the space arena, translation of that into coherent policy that can go for more than one president at a time. Um, we, the, the, the space program seems to have aspects of, of hobby entertainment for newly elected political leaders in a way that, that other strategic enterprises do not. Uh, I've often said this in, in speeches, but you would not find a, a new U.S. president who comes into Washington and, and then, you know, publicly asks the question, uh, gee, what do you think the Marines should do in, during my term as president? Well, we know what the Marines do for the country. They've done it well for a couple of hundred years and more. Um, we, might, we might argue that the Marines need a little more of this or a little less of that in a given administration. We might try to, to uh, figure out how we can best help them in their mission, but we don't totally revise the mission of the Marines every time we get a new president. And yet it seems like every time that we have a new president, we, we have a new discussion as to what the space program should do. Well, the space program, in my opinion, should be about keeping Americans and our allies and partners on the cutting edge of the human frontier. That's what it's for. And um, if, we're, if we don't see that, then I think we're missing something important. So to keep this political level of support, what are the most powerful arguments that you marshal in favor of sending human explorers into deep space, like places like the moon or the asteroids or Mars? Well, uh, the arguments that I muster are the same ones that, that I addressed earlier. I, I won't say that they are convincing because we're not where I want to be yet, but the, the best argument I have is that there is a human future in space. Human societies will go into space, we will find out what's there, and we will figure out ways to exploit it for the benefit of humans. Um, which societies benefit from those discoveries and in innovations will depend on which societies go there. The benefits will not accrue to those people who are watching it on TV. Uh, they will accrue to the people who m determine to lead. I believe that the United States and that Westerners generally should lead. Uh, I, I strongly believe that. And as I've, some, as I've grown fond of saying, the decisions are made by the people who show up. 
What technical advances must we make in order to send humans to Mars? And among these, what would be your top priorities? If we focus on Mars and really deep space, to me, the most important technological advances that we have to pursue are, are space nuclear power and space nuclear propulsion. Um, this gets a little bit geeky, uh, but and I'll have to apologize for that, but uh, chemical propulsion, meaning burning uh, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen in large rockets to send people to Mars and, and get them back, can be done. A absolutely, it can be done. And we can survive on Mars uh, with solar arrays to collect power. We, we can. It'll be a little bit rugged, but we can do it. So it doesn't violate the laws of physics, but it's hard. And deep space exploration beyond Mars is essentially impossible. So going to the asteroid belt or, or even many near-Earth asteroids is, is, is very, very difficult, um, maybe even just not practical without nuclear power and nuclear propulsion systems. And I, I, so those would be very, very high on my list. Um, in a much more mundane manner, uh, the issue of sustaining human life in closed environments for years at a time is extraordinarily difficult. Maintaining crew health, uh, both psychological and physical health, is going to be very difficult. In, in the recent movie, The Martian, uh, I think you'll notice that we the, the designers of the movie featured uh, rotating spacecraft to provide gravity to the crew. I personally think that's going to be pretty important. Um, we uh, will know, uh, one of the things I sometimes say and have said in testimony is that we'll know we're ready to go to Mars when, when we can do the following experiment. When we can put a crew uh, on the International Space Station for six or seven months uh, and let them uh, decondition uh, from zero G, and then we can send them to the moon and let them live on the moon for a year, carrying nothing except what was, was either prepositioned or that they brought with them, then bring them from the moon back to the space station, let them hang out on the station for six or seven months to simulate the return flight from Mars, and then bring them home to the surface of the Earth, and they're all still alive and reasonably healthy, and they didn't need anything except what they brought with them or was sent ahead of time, then we'll know we're ready to go to Mars and not before. So that, there's, there are some real challenges in doing that if you think about it. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. Do the President and Congress need to reform NASA fundamentally if they are serious about pushing human exploration beyond LEO? What steps would you take? I don't think NASA needs to be fundamentally reformed or even substantially reformed in order to carry out the missions of the type we're talking about here. What, what needs to change is that we, we must have as a nation a long-term carefully structured, coherent policy concerning what the United States will do in space, why will we will do it, who we will do it with, and uh, how that will be consistent with the funding that we supply. Uh, when those things are done, um, policy level instructions, which again come from the Congress and can only come ultimately from the Congress in our constitutional system of government, once those instructions are provided to NASA, which is in, in other ways just another federal executive branch agency, the agency can carry out those instructions in a, in a long-term coherent way. If the people at the agency don't do as they're told to do, then they can and should be replaced. But I frankly don't think that that's likely to occur. Uh, the structure of the agency, the people who populate it, the contractors who carry out uh, the missions which are uh, chartered and designed by the agency. Uh, there are some difficulties there, as there always are. 
Um, but those are, are manageable and can demonstrably be managed if we have a coherent policy structure that is consistent with the importance of the mission and the funding that we assign to it. Absolutely. We keep coming back to the fact that a coordinated and successful campaign of human spaceflight takes place on a multi-decadal timescale, and we just cannot repurpose and start anew with every administration. That's exactly right, Ken. And, and again, I used earlier my analogy with the Marines. I could, I could take the Air Force. You, you cannot repurpose the Air Force in a given presidential administration. You know, the Air Force is, is an aspect of national, political, and, and military power projection and capability, and it needs to be supported and sustained over multi-decadal periods. It, it, it cannot be whipsawed about and neither can a program of space exploration. We have the example, Mike, of the Apollo program, which wasn't multi-decadal, but it did succeed within our system of government and with NASA. So why was it able to succeed back in the 1960s? Well, when we say that Apollo succeeded, I, I will have to say somewhat cynically, barely so. Um, in, the, in the political sense, not the technical sense, because as you will no doubt recall, Tom, uh, at the same time that uh, Apollo 11 was carrying, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon, uh, the White House of, of that era uh, was cutting the NASA budget and canceling the last two planned and essentially already paid for Apollo missions, Apollos 19 and 20. Huge lost opportunity. Huge lost opportunity. The rock, and and then of uh, six months later, uh, in early 1970, Apollo 18 was or was canceled. So, while uh, success was being had, cancellation was occurring. It's the only example I can find of spending, um, and I've calculated this carefully in then year dollars, um, something approaching 24 billion dollars to develop a capability, spending a few billion dollars executing uh, such missions and, and, then, and then discarding the whole infrastructure. Uh, it's almost unimaginable that someone would do it and yet we Americans did it. Um, so, but your question was what made it a success? Well, I, I think the chief thing that made it a success and, and I actually teach this in program management was uh, President Kennedy's very succinct declaration of what was to be done, man, moon, decade. Um, you know, land a man on the moon, return him safely to the earth, do it before the decade is out. It was a very crisp statement. Uh, it could be captured on a bumper sticker. Um, secondly, the United States was at that time uh, in a, a battle with a rival system you know, Soviet, Russia, and, and, and communism for, uh, this is a trite expression, but for the hearts and minds of, of you know, many of the non-aligned nations in the world. We felt it, that it was important, and I, I remember this very well, we felt it was important to be ahead in space because uh, such factors were thought to influence how people in the world thought about us as a nation versus our competitor. Um, I would also have to say, again, somewhat cynically, that Apollo probably benefited from President Kennedy's assassination. Um, it, it is, to me, unlikely that we would have been able to go forward had not there been a martyred president who stood behind it. Um, almost everyone loved President Kennedy. Whether they voted for him or not, it was hard to, to deny the fact that he was a charismatic individual and a, and a charismatic leader. And uh, a lot of Apollo's success, I th political success, I think was due to the fact that, that Apollo, Apollo was Kennedy's. Um, in retrospect, I, I'm merely an engineer and not a historian, as you well know, but in retrospect, I would say a lot of Apollo's cancellation was due under President Nixon to the fact that it was Kennedy's a program. It was Kennedy's Apollo. Uh, these political factors do matter. Um, and then finally, Apollo was a success because it only took eight years. Um, 
it's hard to sustain a program even for eight years, but it was eight years and two months from the time when, when President Kennedy declared the lunar goal until Neil and Buzz landed on the moon. Um, if it had been set out as a 15-year program, I'm, I'm, I'm at least personally certain that we'd not made it. Absolutely. There are some things that are easier to do quickly than slowly, like pulling teeth <laughs> and, uh, and human spaceflight. When someone says we're going to the moon, but it's in 2040, uh, we can all yawn. Right. There's nothing you do today that affects any outcome in 2040. That's uh, right. That, that, that people can connect. In, in particular, to expand on this theme, um, four decades ago, uh, the physicist Freeman Dyson, one of my, my personal heroes wrote um, a collection of essays of his called Disturbing the Universe. And in that book, uh, Professor Dyson uh, he addressed many different topics, but one of the topics he addressed was the structuring of, of programs like spaceflight programs that are cutting edge, new, never been done before, the structuring of them such that um, they were achieved by means of intermediate milestones, none of which took more than a few years to reach because the human attention span, he felt, was and, and, and the response to changed circumstances was such that anything that took more than three or four years to get to probably would not be gotten to. And so while he, few people are brighter than Freeman Dyson, uh, and, and I'm not sure I know any of those, uh, Freeman's point was, that many things that are desirable to do require longer than three or four years. And so recognizing human limitations, if you're going to try for such goals, you need to set the programs up in such a way that you can have significant milestones every few years, uh, or you are unlikely to get to the end. And I thought that was, I thought that was very insightful. As you appreciate as well as anyone, continued leadership in space requires the constant infusion of new ideas and knowledge provided by a vibrant and creative workforce. Over the years, the NAC has made several recommendations regarding the need to refresh the workforce and to focus on hiring the most technically competent folks with recent degrees from outstanding institutions. In fact, uh, Jack Schmidt often reminds us that one of the drivers for the success of Apollo was that for the most part, its key engineers were very motivated, very bright, and very young, often in their 20s and early 30s. Today, the average age at the agency is somewhere in the 50s and roughly advancing by about a year each year. Can you talk about NASA's challenge in effectively refreshing its workforce? Uh, yes. Absolutely, and I'm going to raise the game. It's not a NASA problem, it's a national problem, and it's a problem all across the aerospace industry, both military and civilian, uh, human and robotic. It's an, a problem uh, across our nation, and it has been created by the fact that the funding devoted to things in the world of aerospace and defense, that we funding devoted to things we should be doing has greatly decreased in real dollars. That means that young folks don't enter those professions in the numbers that they should be doing. And it means that those people who do remain in the profession are gradually aging. And so our average age has increased. Uh, it's not just the NASA workforce whose age averages a little bit over 50. It's the entire national aerospace workforce. If we can set challenging and exciting projects in front of people, uh, our young professionals will respond by engaging in those projects and the average age will drop. That would be an extraordinarily good thing. I could not agree more with Dr. Schmidt and his assertion uh, about, about the value of a young, energized, uh, bright, technically current workforce. I think the best combination occurs Exactly as with Apollo, when a few senior leaders, the Bob Gilruths and Chris Crafts and Werner Von Brauns of, of that era, George Miller, Sam Phillips, very senior folks are with a lot of experience and a lot of scars are leading an organization largely composed of much younger folks who can, who, who can really do the work uh, and that the 
along the lines that have been laid out for them by their seniors. That that is the combination that works. Absolutely. With, with the benefit of twenty twenty hindsight, does it seem that it might have been better to push on toward Mars by building on the Apollo program? rather than focusing entirely on low-Earth orbit programs such as the shuttle and the International Space Station. I, I know this is water under the bridge, but the question is, at the branch point, had we taken that different path, uh, how do you assess the outcome? Well, again, you've, you've baited one of my favorite hooks because, um, as I think you might recall, I wrote a lengthy paper on this for the 50th anniversary of Sputnik, at the request of uh, no less than Aviation Week and Space Technology. They published it online, and I've been told informally that it still has the single highest number of hits of any of any article they've done. And in that paper, I argued that it, it, essentially exactly your point, that the, uh, the, the better answer for our nation at that time uh, would have been to use the hardware and infrastructure we had developed and repurpose it to to other things. Uh, I'll also remind everybody that uh, we had in being the Skylab program, and I'll point out that two Skylabs docked nose to nose would give you as much or more habitable volume than the space station today, and it could have been put up with two Saturn Vs. Uh, it's not that I would want to ignore the benefit of research in, in low Earth orbit. I, I don't, but we went about getting it the hard way. I'll, I'll certainly say that. Um, moreover, in 1973, this nation owned a space-qualifiable nuclear rocket, which had been tested uh, in the Nevada desert multiple times. Uh, it, it was being designed as an upper stage for the then Saturn V in order to take people to Mars. Of course, it could also have been useful in taking them to the moon. Uh, that program was canceled in 1973 because our nation chose not to go to Mars. Uh, so, so not only have we not preserved infrastructure that we once had and capabilities that we once had, we, we've canceled them outright and would have to reconstruct them if we wanted to go back and do those things. So, yes, I think we took the wrong path. Thank you. So, Mike, when you were a NASA administrator, you strongly supported the Ares 5 heavy lift launch vehicle as the only viable path to getting humans on Mars. Now, its descendant today is called the Space Launch System, and it's somewhat controversial and sometimes perceived to be competing with alternative private rocket offerings like uh, Elon Musk's Falcon 9 Heavy. Uh, can you comment on which approach is best? Well, I can offer my opinion. Um, I'll do so by uh, quoting one of my uh, uh, one of my friends and and most highly respected friends, Wayne Hale, a former shuttle program manager and uh, former space shuttle flight director. Uh, I think Ray, Wayne holds the record, which can never be beaten, of uh, being the flight director for the highest number of shuttle uh, ascent entry phases. One of the best. Yeah. So Wayne said in a speech last October that, and, and I don't mean to quote him exactly because I wasn't copying the words down, and, and so I hope I don't get this wrong, but Wayne essentially in a speech said he was tired of the controversy about whether or not we should build a heavy lifter. And I don't care whether you call it Ares 5 or SLS or you can, you can call it, you know, Tom Jones if you want. <laughs> I, I don't care what we name it. But the value, Wayne was commenting on the value of heavy lift versus um, in-orbit assembly of a large number of smaller payloads. And um, he said, you know, you cannot prove that you would not have been able to do the Berlin airlift with a large number of Piper Cubs. He said, but the logistics would be forbidding. <laughs> and everyone laughed. And the point he was making, of course, was that uh, laws of physics don't don't prevent the in-orbit assembly of very large machines to go to Mars by using many, many, many smaller launch vehicles. Uh, the laws of physics do not prevent that. But it is logistically forbidding. It is likely to be much more expensive. It is likely to be much more time-consuming. Um, to believe otherwise, to, to believe that we would not want the largest transportation capability that we could reasonably put together 
is to single spaceflight out as being somehow different than every other mode of transportation humans have ever used. It is, it is not for nothing that you know Airbus 380s and Boeing 787s uh, have come about and are holding sway in, in the market. It is not for nothing that we ship oil in the largest super tankers we can build. Um, it is not for nothing that, that when you travel out west and, and can see long vistas of train track that you can see trains a mile and a half long, uh, you know, it is not for nothing that we ship cargo across the interstate highway system in in large tractor trailers rather than dividing the payload up and putting it in every the trunk of everyone's car. Uh, every other human transportation or cargo transportation system ever developed has taken advantage of whatever economy of scale can be reasonably achieved by the engineers of their time. Why would we even think about doing it differently for space? Now, my argument, you'll note, Tom, does not single out any given contractor. I have spent most of my life on the government side of the equation. I really don't care what contractor wins the competition for federal tax dollars to build the machines we want built. My interest is more in how we decide what machines we want built. If, if we are serious about space exploration, we want a heavy lifter, you know, and the winner wins and the losers complain. But, you know, I really don't care. Good. And the need for a heavy lift rocket, after all, is driven by the need to carry most of the supplies we need with us to Mars. And current plans for getting to Mars don't assume that we would use the resources produced locally on Mars prior to human arrival. Do you think that uh, the in situ resource utilization or using local resources approach has the enabling role in getting humans to Mars? Is it key? And does the answer change if we assume a sustained presence on Mars rather than a single flag and footprint style mission? Well, you, I, I'm certainly, you can design a flag and footprint mission to Mars that takes everything with you um, and, and doesn't use local resources. And by taking everything with you, I'm including, you know, pre-positioning assets on, on Mars before you get there. Uh, you, you can do that. But I think it's silly. Uh, I, I think one of the first things we need to learn to do is to utilize the resources that space provides in exploring space. So when we return to the moon, one of the first things I think we will reasonably do is to mine the lunar crust for oxygen, uh, not only for breathing purposes, but because in going to and from the moon, the liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen propellant combination is probably what we will continue to use for some time. Seven eighths of the mass of that propellant combination is oxygen, and oxygen is extraordinarily plentiful on the lunar surface and easily extractable with, with solar energy. So that's, as an industrial process, I believe that's one of the first things we'll do. Similarly, um, you know, uh, Bob Zubrin and others have advocated strongly uh, that we can extract necessary propellants and materials from the Martian atmosphere, and I think everyone now knows that uh, the Martian soil is is replete with water. Uh, so, if we don't take advantage of those things, then I, I guess the word I used earlier was silly, and I, I won't change it. Thanks. So do you still think that a government-developed rocket's the best way to get humans to Mars, or do you think privately-developed transportation can play this role? And how do you see the interplay of government and private space efforts interacting on our path to Mars? Well, my first question is, what do you mean by government-developed versus privately-developed? Um, almost all of the money uh, which has gone into Elon Musk's Falcon 9 is government money. It's being the development has been carried out by a non-traditional, a new contractor, and they've done, I'll say, a very good job. But no one should think that that money is, you know, is mostly private or even has very much private component to it. It's mostly been government. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to get into which contractor wins what competitions because, frankly, I don't care. Now... If you're talking about the development of a really heavy lift rocket, so far in human history, no one has come up with a, a market need, if you will, for such a beast. 
the need for such a large rocket uh, is to enable uh, human space exploration beyond low Earth orbit, which so far has been a government enterprise and which I believe for some time will continue to be a government enterprise. Um, so I think it's entirely appropriate that it be, quote, government developed, unquote, and be done to government designs and plans and specifications. Um, that is not to say that there could not be a lot of very useful private commercial commercially developed space transportation of cargo to the moon uh, and, and later to mars uh, i would be i've, I've written papers about this I've, I've actually done business case analyses of it and published them uh, i i would argue that a government sponsored program which would return people to the moon, take people to Mars, um, if it was uh, believed by commercial industry that such a program would be sustained by the government, uh, would be able to sponsor any number of private commercial space ventures in support of that initiative. And from a government perspective, we would only have to pay for services when and as they are delivered. Uh, I'm certain that such private developments would be done much more economically than any public development uh, because competitors compete and, and it makes them more efficient. Uh, so within the context of a national and international program to return to the moon, to later take people to Mars, I, I believe there are enormous commercial opportunities, uh, but I think you have to have the cart and the horse in the proper order. Mike, I, I know you have some thoughts about this, uh, and so I'm uh, eager to hear you elaborate on them. If you were running the Chinese space program and wanted to get to the moon with humans, how would you go about it? <laughs> I, pose, I once posed myself that problem, and I, I, which I, I know you're aware, and the way that I came up with, if I were the Chinese and wanting to do this for the first time, uh, they they now have or are on the verge of having a, a launcher capacity with the Long March 5 of approaching uh, 25 metric tons. So let's just say that that's an achievable goal for the Chinese in the near term. If, uh, if the payloads are split artfully and if you assume that they can develop what we'd call an injection stage of about a kilometer per second of delta V, then uh, with with four launches, uh, one of one of which would carry, with, with sorry, I'll say four launches conducted in two pairs. So the first two launches would carry a uh, an upper stage and a lunar lander, which would then be sent to the orbit of the moon, where they would wait for uh, the second pair of launches, and using uh, a modified. Uh, Shenzhou spacecraft, the current Chinese uh, low orbital spacecraft, if it was modified to include a heavier heat shield, the second pair of launches would include the, a tanker stage and the Shenzhou, and it would go to the moon rendezvous with the uh, Chinese lander. They could, in, in very much then the Apollo style, land on the moon, come back up, and come home. And you could do that with four launches, none of which needed more than 25 tons, which is just about what they uh, have available uh, now or, or close to it. So uh, I, I think, you know, I don't think I'm any smarter than they are. <laughs> and Probably that's how they will go about it when they choose to do so. Hmm. Do you have a prediction about when that might take place, Mike? No, Tom, I'm not a... I, I'm not a student of Chinese culture and politics. I, I would, so I'll talk about capabilities. And, and you used to be a CIA analyst, right? We talk about capabilities, not intentions. Um, they would have the capability to do that, in my opinion, within six or seven years from the, from the time they decide they, they want to. So uh, if they chose to start tomorrow, they could be there by the early 2020s. Well, let's stay on this international theme. You know, we've had a partnership with Russia in the space station program for more than 20 years. Uh, but yet our partnership today seems to be waning as the U.S. finally restores its human launch capability 
in a couple of years. And we seek a domestic alternative to Russian rocket engines in our uh, defense industry satellite launchers. So is the Russian partnership still a useful arrangement? And how do you see the partnership evolving uh, in this new era of deep space exploration? Well, it might surprise some to hear me say this, but I, I think that the Russian and American partnership in space, as, as with our American and European and Canadian and Japanese partnership, has been a really, really, really good thing. Um, Russia has been for many decades more adversarial toward the United States than not. Um, and anything we can do to ameliorate that, I, I think, is a good thing. Uh, we've learned a lot from the Russians in space, and they've learned a lot from us. And uh, so, so I think it's been good. I enjoyed working with our Russian partners when I was doing it personally. Um, but I think including the Russians in the space station partnership, as was done under the Clinton administration, was a, a very good thing. Now today, uh, we're in a bit of a quandary because starting in 2008 with the invasion of Georgia and continuing on through events in, in geopolitics that I, I, I won't enumerate because everyone knows them, um, the difficulty of sustaining a partnership in space ha has grown. Uh, we were 20 years ago when the decision was made to allow uh, then the, the Martin Company at that point to build um, or, or Lockheed Martin, I guess, by that time, when the decision was made to allow them to use the RD-180, the Russian RD-180 engine in the upgraded version of the Atlas rocket, uh, that seemed a safe decision. Um, now, that does not look so smart. And, and so there are arguments going on in Washington about how many RD-180s we will will buy, assuming that the Russians will sell them to us, and what we should do to reduce our dependency on uh, another nation for a, a strategic good. And and I, you know, I've I've taken a public position on that. I served on a on a DOD committee which uh, made made its recommendations that the United States should not should not be dependent upon another nation for such capabilities. Um, which takes us to the issue of the continued partnership. Uh, I'm very much in favor of continuing to try to partner in space with other nations, but partnership is not dependency. For the United States to be dependent upon Russia for getting our astronauts to orbit is strategically unwise and, in, and indeed embarrassing and unseemly. Uh, for the United States to depend upon Russian rocket engine manufacturers when our own aerospace engineers are being laid off is, um, I, I just think, stupid. Um, it, it is strategically unwise, and it is damaging to our own industrial base. Um, partnerships bring partners together, each of which can bring something to the table in the conduct of an overall enterprise that might be more than you know any of them could do by themselves. But to partner with others from a position of dependency upon them, I, I think, is, is a bridge too far. Mike, uh, you and Becky flew here to Pensacola for this interview in your own plane. I recall that you often flew this plane to NASA Advisory Council meetings that were held at various NASA centers around the country. What do you most enjoy about flying? Oh, wow. Uh, I've been flying for many decades. Of course, I'm not in Tom's class. Tom's a former B-52 pilot, uh, something to which I could only aspire. Um, but I've always loved it. I, you're asking me why, and I'm groping for the answer. Um, you know, I, I started as a general aviation private pilot and worked my way up to being a multi-engine instrument instructor. And for decades i have flown my airplane on on government or private business uh, whenever it, it seemed reasonable to do so um what do i like about it um flying is consuming when you're when you're flying 
I'm, I'm not talking about when the autopilot is turned on, but when you're departing or arriving or doing a difficult instrument approach, it consumes you. You, you pay a lot of attention to it and you should. It's a good thing to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, other concerns don't weigh on you at that moment. And, and I enjoy that feeling of commitment. Um, I can't say that I found flying difficult. I, I, I could do it as soon as I got in the airplane. And I, I always found it to be a very easy thing to do. Uh, and so some people talk about the challenge of flying. I didn't, you know, I, I find drawing a picture to be challenging. I can't draw you a picture with a gun to my head. Um, but I could fly from the moment I got in an airplane, and, and I enjoyed being able to do it. Um, it's, it's freeing. Uh, you're, you're up above looking out at things. You are the master of your own fate. The, the more difficult about, part about flying is the decision-making. You know, when do I go? When is it best if I don't go because the weather's not right? Um, you know, do I need a fuel stop? Should I press on? Um, what are the pluses and minuses of that? Uh, the decision making in flying, especially if you do a lot of cross, cross country flying as I do, I mean, I have thousands of hours of, of cross country. There's a lot of decision making involved in that that I find interesting and, and challenging and, and very rewarding. Um, the independence. I, I can I can go when I want to go. Um, I, if I want to extend my stay, I can do so. Uh, I'm not at the I'm not at the behest of an airline. Hmm. So those those are the sorts of things that attract me to flying. And I and I like I love to teach. And when I had time for it, I used to love to teach flying. Although I I was was humbled so often because I found so many students who had. Uh, um, a smoother touch on the controls than I did. I'll just say that, that it was often humbling to be teaching someone who after eight or 10 hours was, was smoother than I was. Uh, but um, nonetheless, I, I, I guess I like most aspects of flying. I'm sorry I can't give you a crisper answer. Oh, that's, that's okay. That was a good one. Mm -hmm. So Mike, uh, aside from flying, what do you like to do in your free time? I know you've been characterized as a voracious reader and an avid golfer, but fill in that picture for us. Well, both those are true. Um, I'm, I read all the time. Um, I'm currently in the middle of two books. One is called The Innovators, and it's about the development of the computer industry and, and the whole Silicon Valley high-tech culture. Fascinating book, um, especially to an old machine language programmer like myself. Um, and then another book, uh, Into the Black, about the... the uh, development of the space shuttle and the inclusion of the mold, the manned orbiting lab astronauts into the NASA cadre of astronauts and the relationships between the intelligence community and the space shuttle and, and all of that. It's quite a fascinating book. And then I like to read junk fiction. Um, John Sanford is a, an absolute favorite of mine. I, I like all of his novels. I, I just finished a book uh, he co-wrote with another author, uh, Stein called Saturn Run. It's among the best science fiction books I've, I've ever read. So I, and then I, you know, I read, I love The Economist even when I disagree with them. And uh, I read science news every two weeks when it comes out and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I played competitive golf in college and thereafter, and I'm, I'm still a three handicapper or so. And, uh, I, I do love golf. It's a game that appeals to, I guess, a lot of people who have a very analytical mindset. It, it certainly will offer you all the challenges uh, you would care to take on. <laughs> I don't know if you play golf, Tom, but... Uh, no, but I've heard it teaches you humility. Uh, if, if you pl can play golf without absorbing a healthy dose of humility, you're a better man than I. <laughs> Well, Mike, this has been just a terrific interview, and we appreciate you joining us here on STEM Talk. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure for me as well, Ken and Tom. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mike. STEM Talk. 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 
Wow, I could really tell that the three of you were enjoying yourselves. You and Tom Jones did a really nice job on this interview with Mike Griffin. Thanks, Don. It was great fun for Tom and I as well. Mike is certainly a fascinating guy with interesting positions on many subjects, about which he has thought long and hard. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this episode and find pointers to more information about Mike Griffin, stemtalk.us. I would like to take a moment here to thank the rapidly growing and extraordinarily discerning STEM Talk audience. We understand that there are many thousands of podcasts and we are honored that you listen to ours. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.